different from B. When they come together, they form a parasite type AB, which is further different from A and B. So that's the increase in the diversity. And under low transmission, you realize that um, there is less um, outcrossing and there's more inbreeding. So you have more similar parasite types coming out, and so diversity is low. So in, in monitoring um, complexity of infection, we'll be able to monitor transmission. Transmission changes, we'll be able to know whether transmission is reducing or um, increasing. And in so doing, we'll be able to tell whether an intervention is having an effect on the transmission or not. Um, and also, there is a need to understand how transmission reduction influences evolution of drug resistance. Um, currently, in literature, there are two schools of thought. One school of thought is saying that um, under high transmission, you have an increase in the evolution of drug resistance markers. And under low transmission, you have um, um, no, under low transmission, you have an increase in the frequency of drug resistance markers. And then under high transmission, you have um, a decrease. And then we attributed this again to sexual recombination. So that in the high transmission setting, you will have um, a lot of parasite types in circulation. And then therefore you have a um, high sexual recombination, you have a lot, a lot of diversity. So that if um, there is a drug resistant parasite or drug, drug resistant gene in the parasite population, um, it's, it's not likely that to show up in the high frequency because of the high diversity. However, if you have uh, in a low transmission setting where there's inbreeding, the parasite types are more similar, and therefore, um, if there's a drug resistant parasite in the population, uh, its likelihood of showing up with the high frequencies is, can be seen. And there's another school of thought that says the opposite, and they are saying that in high transmission setting, they expect to see an increase in um, evolution of drug resistant markers, and in low transmission setting, they expect to see um, um, a decrease, and they attribute this to something called um, intra-host dynamics. So they are saying that in a high transmission setting, you have um, where you have a drug-sensitive parasite type and then drug-resistant parasite type. Um, the person shows symptoms and is treated. The treatment clears the drug-sensitive ones, and then the drug-resistant parasites have the opportunity to thrive. And so you have a, a hike in the um, drug-resistant markets. Um, so. It's not clear what exactly transmission changes does to um, evolution of drug resistant matter. So it was interesting to find out what that does. Uh, so the aim of my study was to determine the effect of indoor residual screen on the dynamics of PFAS for population and the frequency of drug resistant markers in the good region. My objectives um, were to investigate the complexity of infection at baseline and during IRS during and post IRS to estimate allele frequency distribution before and during um, intervention and to characterize and compare frequency of known drug resistant markers in the pool below you uh, at baseline and after in the receiver <coughs> So the study is a, um, a, a cross sectional study and a study site, like I said, is going to be your um, transmission there is high and seasonal for two distinct seasons. You have the rainy season and the dry season. The rainy season is between May and, and October and peaks in August. And the dry season is between November and April. Um, for the sampling, um, random, random um, selection of households for children under five screening using um, RDT and microscopy. Um, and the collection of people are supposed blood samples from filter paper. So this was done in 2010, before the IRS was started. And in every year, in 2011, we did do it before the IRS start, starts. So, and after every uh, so, rainy season, the, the screen and then take the positive blood samples. I selected 150 samples, um, 50 from the uh, pre IRS group, and 50 from um, the 2012 group after two years of IRS, and 50 from the um, post IRS. Um, this is a study site. I picked my samples from two communities, Ifuk and then Nanya, in the group area. So the laboratory methods included um, involved um, DNA um, extraction, um, genotype 11 neutral SNPs using the high resolution dotting curve analysis by uh, Daniel Sita. And then we use the same method, the HRM to genotype um, drug resistant markers and we focus on the PSERT put on 72 to 76, uh, associated with colloquial resistance and um, PFMDR um, 76, 8. Uh, 86, 184, and 1246 associated with nephropin and chloroquine, and then DHFR uh, 108 associated with um, 
will meet something. So these are uh, figures for the prevalence of parasemia and entomological inoculation rates at the district. Um, so it shows that transmission is reducing. You could tell that um, so the prevalence of parasemia in 2010 was 50.4, it dropped to 50, and then to 47.7 in 2012, and then to 20.6 in 2021. ERA, there was a drop in um, um, entomological figures, yeah. So for the CO, I needed to see whether individual transmission is reducing. Can we see that also in the complexity of infection? So we realized, um, we found out um, the, that in Nigeria we had um, eight um, unique parasite types in 2010. And then eight, um, as the Indonesia screen was going on, we found 18 unique parasite types circulating in 2012, and then further increased to 21 in 2014. For Kufu, we had um, 14 parasite, unique <coughs> parasite types circulating in 2010. That was an uh, increase to 15 in 2012, and then to 18 in 2014. And in 2010, we found three common uh, parasite types um, between. Um, yeah, three between um, Nigeria and Kufuk, and then found two each between, um, yes, Nigeria and Kufuk for 2012 and then 2014. Um, so for the COIs, you compare the mean COIs, um, the complexity of infection in 2010 for Nigeria was 2.0, and then it dropped to 1.4 in 2012, and then it was maintained in 1.4 in 2014. And for Kufuk, um, it was 1.7 and it dropped to 1.6 and then to 1.3. And so you can see here that um, indeed as transmission was reducing, there was a reduction in complexity of infection as it's predicted in the future. And for the allele frequencies, um, there was no particular trend. We, that's the mid term allele, um, they were increasing, some were increasing in the course of IRS and some were decreasing in the course of IRS. But the unique ones here, is the ones highlighted in red. You realize here, here, and here, the, there was no change in um, the return islands in the course of IRS, they were 100%. But then over here, 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 and here, the, there was no um, one. It's everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there was one type of showing that there was no return process showing that. Tension. Yeah, for the frequency of blood to cell markers, um, um, 70, 76 is the key um, marker associated with chloroquine resistance. We found a drop in, in, in 76 uh, marker in Nairo and Kufu. And again, we found a decrease also in um, the uh, um, MDR 86 marker, which is also the key um, marker associated with resistance to chloroquine again and then um, uh, mefloquine. This would be because we've, we've, we've stopped using chloroquine and therefore um, the, what, the pressure on the parasites has dropped and therefore um, the water types are being selected at the expense of the um, um, mutant um, parasite types because again um, the um, water types are more fit than the um, mutant one. Um, so the same was seen here too for um, um, DHFR108 associated with um, so vitamin E. And also, um, it tends to agree with the second school of thoughts that is saying that as transmission reduces, they expect to see a reduction in um, um, the frequency of drug resistant markers. So, here, um, it, it results show that in, as transmission reduces, you have um, um, less people getting sick, and therefore, there's no pressure on the parasite types. And so the what, what type of should I say the sensitive parasites have a chance to thrive over the resistant ones, and so that's why we are seeing um, a drop in the drug uh, um, resistant parasites. These are the unique haplotypes we found for CIT, um, CIT, and which this is reported to be common in Africa. And then we found these ones um, for NDR, and this is what is um, for. NFPD is what is found in Africa. Uh, yeah. uh, so for a summary, um, transmission reduction by IRS caused a reduction in COI. 
Um, the dynamics of the parasite population was complex, as there was no specific trend in alien frequencies, like I said. And then there was a general reduction in the frequency of drug in some markets in the course of IRS. Um, I would recommend that the study be done um, in a different study site and a larger population um, to see whether you, as transmission reduces, you do really have um, a reduction in the frequency of drug in some markets on um, GOI or not. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the following. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, I would like to take one or two questions for James. Um, I'm James Abubi. Uh, I want to know uh, what are the clinical implications of polygenomic infections and why is it so important for us to study polygenomic infections? Polygenotype. 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 Yeah, okay. So I'm asking why do you think we should be studying polygenomic infections? Otherwise, uh, it's yes, exactly. Okay. Now, so, like I was saying, uh, um, um, an increase in uh, clonal diversity can give um, indication on what is happening in transmission, whether transmission is busy or not, like I indicated. So um, um, when, when you have a hike in the uh, um, complexity of infection or the clonal diversity, you tend to know that um, uh, there is transmission increase, and then when there is a decrease, you tend to find out that there is a reduction in trans transmission. So you can, you're able to predict what happens in transmission using that. A quick announcement. Um, there will be a bus waiting outside to the left, uh, immediately after the last session, the next talk, which is the last talk of the day. And it will take those who are interested in joining the inaugural lecture at the Great Hall. And then the bus will come back after the coffee break to pick faculty who want to go to the lodge here for the after party of the day. And then the third one is somebody dropped the car key. So please see me for it. <laughs> so Yes, uh, I'm very privileged to uh, introduce one of the world's world most renowned scientists. Um, okay, can we skip that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, he, he, he actually worked at um, uh, the Wellcome Trust Sanya Institute. He joined uh, the institute in the year 2007 and he's a good leader. He actually has achieved a lot and he's actually the architect of uh, the past module. So we are, uh, I believe that uh, most of us have used it. I'm very privileged uh, uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Oliver Benka. Thank you very much. Great privilege to be here. Um, I want to congratulate you on the great, the great program. Um, and, and I'm particularly pleased to be here because they don't really let me out that much <laughs> since I work on a malaria parasite of rodents. So this is taking us all the way to the very basic research, which is of course very important if we want to find new targets for drugs and vaccines and really understand the biology of the parasite. So I hope you'll get something out of it. Um, what we have recently uh, started to do is release data from um, a genome scale functional analysis of the malaria parasite, and I want to talk about that. Um, let's see how this moves. And this is just to remind you that at the Sanger Institute there's a larger malaria program, and you guys may be very familiar with. Um, the, the reference genome was generated by Matt Barryman with many parasites in, in the past, because Newball, or of uh, 
all the um, work that the Malaria Den Consortium and Dominic Rakowski do using genome sequencing of parasites and, and mosquitoes and humans to get at the interactions between these and uh, the evolution of the genomes. Um, but also when that started seven or eight years ago, Julie Rayner and I joined the institute and we started to ask more complement very complementary questions. We started to ask what are the functions of all these genes? Yeah, if we understand the evolutionary pressures that they are under, uh, that doesn't help uh, all that much. We really want to know what they are doing. And we started to ask why can you do genome-wide screens for gene functions in model organisms like yeast, and why can you not do it in malaria parasites? And what are the hurdles we have to overcome? Um, and we started to focus, sorry, going the wrong way, we started to focus, and, and the reasons for, for um, finding it very difficult to study gene functions by reverse genetics in malaria parasites are, of course, that we are dealing with intracellular parasites that are very hard to transfect, and we are dealing with organisms that have an inherently low homologous recombination rate, it seems, and whose DNA is incredibly AT rich and repetitive and very unstable in E. coli. So it becomes very hard um, to make efficient gene knockout vectors. And um, yeah, RNA interference doesn't work, there were no efficient transposable systems, and even now in the absence of non-homologous end joining, CRISPR-Cas based screens are not working. So we really were faced with the problem. And we started to tackle it using Plasmodium burgia because it had, this is the parasite that, that still has the most attractable genetic system uh, among all the malaria parasites. And because it's a great system to study the, the core biology of the parasite around its life cycle in its different hosts, uh, both in vitro and in vivo. And we made uh, progress in small steps over the years. And the first major uh, step was to find out that we could use this linear plasmid which is a phage-based um, plasmid that, re that, that replicates in E. coli as a linear piece of DNA. It's never supercoiled um, and, and therefore can harbor, we think, long uh, stretches of very AT-rich DNA. Um, we discovered that and then found uh, that it was very hard to do conventional restriction ligation cloning with these uh, vectors, but that we could use viral recombinases to manipulate them very effectively and robustly in 96 ball plates. So we were actually able to use the vectors that are based on long genomic DNA inserts, or make, make knockout vectors based on long genomic DNA inserts uh, in an E. coli genomic DNA library. And we could do that on 96 ball plates, and we built a pipeline to do it. And we can run a, a, a plate through that pipeline every week, so we can make 96 knockout or tagging vectors for different genes every week. And that's a methodology we published a while ago. And actually, from having a scalable technology to having something actually operate at scale, then was still a few years of work. Um, but that's where we are now. We have uh, built together with my colleague Julian the Plasmogen Resource. Plasmogen stands for Plasmodium Genetic Modification Project. Um, this is a free community resource of highly efficient knockout and tagging vectors for. Uh, plus Modiburgia genes. It doesn't yet cover every gene, but more than half of the genome. Uh, we've produced toolkits to work with these vectors, and we train people and disseminate the technology as much as we can. Um, we build a, a website for the resource um, where all these reagents are freely available, and we have sent out uh, uh, hundreds and hundreds of these vectors to many uh, labs worldwide, and this is a, because this is a popular resource in the Burgia community. Um, and this is just an illustration uh, that uh, taking a, a vector design for a particular gene uh, using increasingly non-homology arms, we really uh, bring out the transfection efficiency a lot. Now that is actually quite important, uh, together with the fact that since all these vectors are always linear, they don't form episomes within the parasite. And anyone who's made a transgenic falciparum parasite, the question is always, has it integrated or is it episome? And if we detect the vector, we think it's integrated, because there is, we don't have an episode problem. We don't have these false qualities anymore. That together means we can um, now make uh, mutants very effectively. In fact, we can generate 100 mutants by co-transfecting 100 vectors in a single electro operation. We can then put all those mutants into a mouse immediately, uh, kill off all the drug-sensitive wild-type parasites, and we now see 
um, you have dozens of mutants growing up in parallel in the same mouse. And we can measure the slope of the growth rate of each of these mutants independently to get a growth rate phenotype for each mutant. Now, of course, you will wonder how we do that, because uh, on a blood film, of course, all these mutants would look the same. So how can we actually measure the abundance on a given day of each mutant independently? And for that, we use a trick. We have included in each vector an